Today, I have a one hour advanced English masterclass to help you become fluent faster. Welcome back to G4's English. Of course, I'm Jennifer Nell. Let's get started. First, in this masterclass, you're going to test your listening skills of real English so you can speak fast and understand native English speakers. Let's start the test now. Here are your instructions for the entire lesson. I am going to say a sentence three times and I want you to write down exactly what you hear in the comment section below. After, I'll explain what I said, I'll explain the pronunciation changes that take place in fast English, and I'll also explain the expressions that I use. In order for you to pass this test, you need to do two things. First, you need to hear the individual words I say, but also you need to understand the meaning of what I say. So you need to understand the expressions that I use. Are you ready for your quiz? All right, well, let's get started with number one. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. I said, cut her some slack. She's a newbie. Did you get that? Do you know what this means? First, let's talk about the pronunciation changes. Her, him, and them, we often shorten these. So her, I get rid of the H sound and it sounds like er, er. But then I combine it to the word before, cutter, cutter. Cutter, cutter some slack. She's, this is a contraction. Native speakers use contractions all the time in spoken English. She's represents she is. She is a newbie. She's, she's a newbie. Now, do you know what this means? To cut someone some slack, this is an expression and it's when you punish someone less severely than you normally would. And a newbie, this is a new employee. A new employee or even a new member to a group, you can refer to that person as a newbie, a newbie. So it makes sense that you might cut a newbie some slack. You might be less severe with that person because they're new, they're still learning, they're still training. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. Our second listening exercise, I'll say it three times. Give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. Give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. Give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. I said, give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. Give me, we reduce these to sound like gimme, 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 gimme 20. 20 here means 20 minutes. Commonly, we drop the minutes when it's obvious. Call me in five instead of call me in five minutes. Gimme 20. Give me 20 minutes. Give me 20 to whip up. Whip up is a phrasal verb. For the pronunciation, notice is whip up, whip up, whip up because of linking, whip up. Whip up means to prepare something quickly. We specifically use this in a cooking context. Whip up some appies. What are appies? Well, I just said that we use the phrasal verb whip up in a cooking culinary context. What does appy sound like? Anything you can think of? Appetizers? Appetizers. Native speakers, we love shortening words. So we take the word appetizer and we shorten it to appy. Appy, because it's plural in my example, appies, appies. Another common 
shortened word is simply apps. So you could say, give me 20 to whip up some apps or whip up some appies. Both are commonly used. Are you ready for your next listening exercise? She's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. She's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. She's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. I said, she's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. For pronunciation, notice she's got. Here, the contraction is she has. She has got. I know this because grammatically, it isn't correct to say she is got. It's she has got, she's got. She's got some nerve. What does that mean? To have some nerve is an expression to say, how dare she? She has some audacity. So you're criticizing her behavior to say that she has no right to do something. She's got some nerve. Now what does she have no right to do? Well, is sauntering in 30 minutes late. To understand this, you need to know what saunter in means. When you saunter, it means you walk in a very relaxed, casual, unhurried way to saunter. In here means into the office, into the room, into the meeting. She sauntered in 30 minutes late. So basically she came to the meeting 30 minutes late and when she came, she was so relaxed and she didn't show any sense of urgency, even though she was 30 minutes late. She's got some nerve doing that. Our next listening exercise, I got to hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. I got to hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. I got to hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. I said, I got to hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. Did you get this one? Got to is pronounced gotta. I gotta hand it. Notice the linking here. Hand it, did. I gotta hand it. Now, I said to you but native speakers will frequently reduce both of these and say t, 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 ya, or ya, t, ya, t, ya. Gotta hand it to ya, t, ya. But I believe I said to you. I gotta hand it to you. I gotta hand it to ya. You'd is a contraction. The D stands for would. You would, you'd. You'd. It's difficult to hear that D because it's very soft, but grammatically it's important that it's there. You'd pull it off. Notice the linking, pull it, lit, pull it, pull it off. When you hand it to someone, it means that you recognize that someone deserves praise or respect. So by saying, I gotta hand it to you, means I have to acknowledge that your actions deserve praise or respect. And why am I doing this? Because the person pulled something off. When you pull something off, it means you achieve something difficult. You succeed at doing something difficult. So that's why this person deserves praise. I gotta hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off, but you did. Our last listening exercise. I've got to have a little me time. I've got to have a little me time. I've got to have a little me time. I said, I've got to have a little me time. Here, notice we have the same gotta reduction. Got to, gotta. This time, I said, I've. I have as a contraction, I've, I've gotta, I've gotta, I've gotta. I've gotta have 
A little will sound like lil, little, a little, lil, a little me time. Now, what is me time? Me time is simply personal time. It's time when you can do whatever you want to do. It's your personal time. So of course, I've got to have a little me time. I must have some time for me to do whatever I want to do. Personal time, me time. Now let's do some imitation practice to make sure that you practice, practice, practice this natural pronunciation. I am going to say each sentence three times and I want you to repeat it out loud. And you can do this exercise as frequently as you'd like. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. Cut her some slack, she's a newbie. Give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. Give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. Give me 20 to whip up some appies for the party. She's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. She's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. She's got some nerve sauntering in 30 minutes late. I gotta hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. I gotta hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. I gotta hand it to you. I didn't think you'd pull it off. I've gotta have a little me time. I've gotta have a little me time. I've gotta have a little me time. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. Now let's review three very common words that I hear mistakes with all the time, even from my most advanced students. Should, have, and must to. Let's talk about the difference between should, must, and have to. Now, all three of these are modal verbs, and we use them to talk about obligation or to give advice. First, let's talk about should. We use should to give advice, our opinion, or a recommendation. So keep in mind, should is not an obligation. So let's think of a scenario where you could give advice, an opinion, or a recommendation. Let's say your friend calls you and says, I feel overwhelmed at work. So your friend's in a negative situation and you want to give some advice, an opinion, or recommendation. You can use should. You can reply back and say, you should talk to your boss. Now let's take a look at the structure. We need should and a base verb. The base verb is simply the infinitive without to. You should talk. You should talk to your boss. I could use a negative and I could say, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take on any more work. Or maybe I could give her some advice or my recommendation, my opinion, and say, you should ask a colleague for help. Now it's your turn to practice this structure. Let's say I call you and I say, I have a really bad headache. What's some advice, a recommendation, or an opinion you can share with me using should or shouldn't? And remember, you need your base verb. So put your example in the comments now. Now let's talk about must. Must is used for obligation. For example, you must finish the report by five o'clock. I have no option. I must finish the report by five o'clock. It's an obligation. Now let's take a look at the structure. We use must with a base verb. You must 
finish. You must finish the report by five o'clock. I might get an email from the government that says you must file your taxes by the end of the month. Or to apply for a job, they might tell me you must submit your application online. So now it's your turn to practice. I want you to leave an example in the comments using must. And remember, it's an obligation and you need a base verb. So leave your example now. Let's move on to have to. Have to is also used for obligation, but generally that obligation is coming from someone else, an outside force. For example, I could say, I have to walk my dog. So first let's take a look at the sentence structure. Here we have have and then our infinitive. So keep in mind, this one we use have to have to and the base verb i have to walk my dog so whether or not i want to walk my dog isn't really the issue here is that as a pet owner i'm obligated to walk my dog i have to walk my dog or i could say I have to babysit my cousin this weekend. So again, the obligation is coming from somewhere else. So maybe my aunt is requiring that I do this or another family member. I have to babysit my cousin this weekend. Remember, to babysit or infinitive. Or I could say, I have to buy a new car. Now the obligation is my current car doesn't work anymore. So I have to buy a new car. It's not my choice. I don't want to, but I have to because my current car doesn't work. So now it's your turn to practice. Let us know in the comments something you have to do this week. Have to do. Remember to use the infinitive. So to summarize, should is used with advice, opinion, or recommendation. Must and have to are used with obligations. You might be wondering, what's the difference? Well, generally, I see must being used by the government or official bodies, official bodies that give us rules and regulations. And I see it on online forms as well. That's when I see must the most. Now with have to, I see that as an outside pressure. So that would be the difference between those two. And remember, should and must plus base verb, but have to verb, have in the infinitive. You have already improved your English fluency. Let's keep going and we're going to read a news article from the BBC together. And this exercise will help you improve all areas of your English. So first, let me read the article in full so you have a general idea of the context and you can pay attention to my pronunciation as well. And then I will explain some key vocabulary and grammar points. So I'll read the article in full now. Biodiversity. Can we set aside a third of our planet for nature? It's being called a last chance for nature. 100 countries backing calls to protect 30% of the planet. The aim is to reach this goal by 2030 and conserve forests and other vital ecosystems in order to restore the natural world. The 30 by 30 target is the key ambition of the UN Biodiversity Summit, COP15. But as the talks in Montreal, Canada move into their final days, there is division over this and many other targets. Scientists have warned that with forests and grasslands being lost at unprecedented rates and oceans under pressure from pollution and overfishing, humans are pushing the earth beyond safe limits. This includes increasing the risk of diseases like SARS, CoV-2, Ebola, and HIV, spilling over from wild animals into human populations. 
Under the proposed agreement, countries would sign up to targets to expand protected areas, such as nature reserves. It draws inspiration from the so-called father of biodiversity, the biologist Edward O. Wilson, who called for half of Earth to be protected. But there is debate over how much land and sea to include, and some scientists fear the targets may be diluted. So now let's talk about some of the key vocabulary and grammar concepts. If there's a specific word you don't understand or grammar concept, feel free to leave it in the comment section and I'll do my best to answer it. So let's start right at the title here, biodiversity. Can we set aside a third of our planet for nature? Excellent question. I certainly hope we can. Let's take a look at this, to set aside. This is a phrasal verb, so I have my verb, which is set, and my preposition aside. To set something aside. Now you set something aside, in this case the something is a third of our planet for nature. When you set something aside, it means you reserve it. And generally, we reserve whatever that it is for a future use. So in the context of our planet, we're saying take 30% of it and reserve it. And we're going to reserve it for a specific purpose and that, in this case, it's nature. So we're not going to use it for any other purpose. We use this a lot in a business context. For example, can you set aside a few minutes to discuss the project? So you could ask your boss this, your client this, a coworker this. In this case, we're talking about setting aside time because you have a set amount of time, eight hours in your workday, right? And you're going to reserve an amount of time, in this case, just a few minutes for a specific purpose. And in this case, that specific purpose is to discuss the project. So for now, get comfortable using this with time, but you can absolutely practice with other some things as well. Now I do want to point out, this is a question and I know this because for one, I'm starting with my modal verb can, which is a question word, and I also have a question mark. Now for pronunciation, if you go back to when I read the article, you may have noticed something called inflection when my voice raised at the end. We do that for yes or no questions. So I'm going to read this again and notice how my inflection rises so my voice is high at the very end of this word because it's a question. Can we set aside a third of our planet for nature? Nature. Remember, we do that for yes or no questions. So inflection for yes, no questions. Let's continue on. It's being called a last chance for nature. 100 countries backing calls to protect 30% of the planet. Okay, what does it mean to back calls? Are we talking about a telephone call? In this case, the call is to do something specific. You can call on someone to do something. For example, I call on the government to protect the environment. I'm not calling the government. I'm calling on the government. I'm requesting that they do something specific. Now, when I back a call, the verb to back, it means to support. So it's saying that 100 countries support protecting 30% of the planet. And remember, this call represents the request. Request to do something. That's the call in this case. And back means to support. Support. So let's think of an example. What could I say? The client wants us to 
back their price increase. Notice how I put the client singular, but then I put my possessive as a plural, their price increase. Native speakers do this because the client could be male or female. And when we don't want to be gender specific, we use there. This isn't official in the dictionary. It's a force of habit. The correct way, according to the dictionary, would be the client wants us to back his price increase, her price increase, or if you want to be gender neutral, you would have to say his or her price increase because there is no singular that represents both genders. So native speakers will frequently say their because it's just easier than saying his or her. Just keep that in mind though, because for your IELTS exam, this is not currently a grammar rule, is just something that we do. The client wants us to back his price increase. In this case, back, remember, it means support, support. You probably know this, or it might make sense to you when you think of the expression, the idiom in English, I got your back. I have your back. If you say that to someone, it means I support you. Don't worry. I have or I got your back. We use it with both the verb have or the verb got. Both of them are very common. I have your back. I got your back. And that means I support you. So that is where this comes from perhaps, but now you learn this expression as well. So let's continue on. The aim, aim is another way of saying goal. So if you want an alternative added to your vocabulary, that sounds very formal and advanced, you can use aim. The aim of my project is to, instead of the goal. The aim of the proposal the aim is to reach this goal by 2030 and conserve forests and other vital ecosystems in order to restore the natural world. Vital is a great word to add to your vocabulary. It means necessary, necessary ecosystems and other vital. When something is vital, you cannot have an option without it. It has to be there. It's necessary and other vital ecosystems. So for our planet, we can't not have fish in the sea. That would create widespread disaster across the world, right? So fish in the sea are vital. They're necessary. And an ecosystem is just one element of the world, one natural element of the world. I'll teach you an advanced sentence structure that you can use with the word vital because we commonly say it's vital that I talk to the client today. So it's saying it's necessary, but vital sounds very strong. It sounds like if I don't talk to the client today, something bad will happen. It's vital. So it's very strong. It's almost a little dramatic. It will definitely get someone's attention. If somebody says it's vital that I talk to you today, I would want to know what that person wants to tell me because it sounds very important. Sometimes, even though this is already quite strong, we make this even stronger by saying it's absolutely vital that I talk to you today or the client today. This is to make it even stronger. But keep in mind, you don't need this because it's already very strong, but you can include it. So you might say <laughs> it's vital 
that I become affluent and confident. I always like to add confident because I know a lot of students who are fluent, but they're not confident. So I always like to include both of those. It's vital that I become a fluent and confident English speaker. Now, it might be vital because you won't get the job without it, right? Or you won't be able to get a promotion without it. So this is a very nice sentence structure. And notice the sentence structure. To be vital. It is vital. That. Okay. That. And then you have a clause. A clause is simply a sentence. We have a subject a verb and an object. So to be vital that, and then your clause practice that in the comments below. Let's continue on the 30 by 30 target. This 30 by 30. Well, think back. It was right here, 30%, right? by 2030. So it's just a clever way of saying 30% by 2030, 30 by 30 target is the key ambition of the UN Biodiversity Summit COP15. You've probably heard about COP15. It's been in the news a lot recently. But as the talks in Montreal, Canada, woohoo, Montreal. I live two hours from Montreal, by the way. But as the talks in Montreal, Canada move into their final days, there is division over this and many other targets. If there's division, division means separation, right? So it means some countries want this, some countries want this. There's division. I guess another way of saying it might be disagreement, disagreement. Disagreement. That's a good one. And notice our preposition. When you're learning a new word, it's useful to understand how it's used in a complete sentence. You need the preposition over. Division over something. And we would use over with disagreement as well. Disagreement over something. And the something being this. So the this, I guess, is the 30 by 30 target and many other targets. Scientists have warned that with forests and grasslands being lost at unprecedented rates and oceans under pressure from pollution and overfishing. Okay, let's just stop there because it's quite a long sentence. Unprecedented, unprecedented, unprecedented. When something is unprecedented, it means it's never happened before. It's never happened before. So this is the first time it's happening. The fact that forests and grasslands are disappearing, I'm just going to say 10% per year. No idea if that's correct. That has never happened before. It's unprecedented. Unprecedented rates and oceans under pressure from pollution and overfishing. Over added to the verb fishing. Overfishing means fishing too much. Fishing too much. Fishing too much. Overfishing. Humans are pushing the earth beyond safe limits. When you push something beyond a limit, so this is the limit and earth is right here behind the limit. And the limit is you can't go beyond this, okay? But when you push it, it means you're going more than what is wanted or needed or required. So we use this a lot when we're doing tasks. I might say this, what task? This accounting problem is pushing us beyond our limits. And in this case, what could your limits be? Well, it could be your knowledge. So your knowledge of accounting is here, 
but this project requires your knowledge to be here greater than what it currently is. So it could be your knowledge. It could be your time, your resources, many other things that could represent that limit. So that's a good expression, pushing beyond the limits there. Let's continue on. This includes, so they're listing how the earth is being pushed beyond its limits, more than wanted, needed, required, necessary. This includes increasing the risk of diseases like SARS, CoV-2, I don't know what this is, CoV-2, Ebola, and HIV. Spilling over from wild animals into human populations. When something spills over, it, it's another way of saying transfers. So let's, let's say this problem is in the accounting department, which is here. But then I have the marketing department here. The problem should stay in the accounting department, but it might spill over into the marketing department, which means it, it transfers into the marketing department. So now that problem is in two places. So we do use this for, for general problems. So you might actually, a good example I just thought of was my work is spilling over into my personal life. So your work should be here at work, but it's spilling over, it's transferring to, it's affecting. So I guess that's an easy way to think of it. When, when a problem or issue in one area starts affecting another area. So one area in this case is work. And the other area is your personal life. That happens a lot, right? It could be a conflict, a conflict where someone is spilling over into another relationship, for example. So that's, that's a good expression. Practice that one in the comments as well. It's more of an advanced sentence structure. And notice this double preposition, over, but then if you want to specify the the part that's receiving the problem you have to use into is spilling over. And then this into belongs to the area that's receiving it. So notice that for, for forming the sentence correctly. Let's continue on under the proposed agreement. Proposed means that this has not been officially signed. So it's just proposed. It's not official. So something that has been suggested or recommended, but not official yet, yet meaning that it can be official in the future, but it's also possible that it won't be official under the proposed agreement. Countries would sign up to targets to expand protected areas such as nature reserves. It draws inspiration from the so-called father of biodiversity, the biologist Edward O. Wilson, who called for half of earth to be protected. So here we're seeing this again. He's not calling. He's not making a call. He's requesting something specific happen. So I don't know if I wrote the definition before, so I will now to call for something to request something specific to happen. For example, the activists called for laws to protect the environment. They requested let's continue. But there is debate over how much land and sea to include, and some scientists fear the targets may be diluted. Notice our preposition here, debate over. There's debate over something. 
I'm sure you know what debate means is when one person wants this, one person thinks that, and there is not agreement. But I just want you to notice the preposition here, debate over something. Now, diluted, in this case, is acting as an adjective because I have my verb be, be diluted. When you dilute something, you make it less strong. This is actually commonly used in cooking. So let's say I have this small glass of water, right? But let's say this is entirely lemon juice. That would be very strong. If I took a sip of that, it would be very strong. So if I want to dilute it, I need to make this less strong. How do I do that? Well, obviously, I can pour water in, and when I add water to this lemon juice, it will dilute the lemon juice. It will make it less strong. So we commonly use this with liquids. Let's say you got a cup of coffee and it was just very strong. The taste was so strong. You might dilute it by adding some water. You could do that. You might add some milk as well to make it less strong, but we commonly use it by adding water. Now, in this case, they're talking about the target. So the targets may be diluted, which means less strong, right? Less strong, commonly used with cooking or beverages. I'm just going to write my example for you now. That lemon juice is too strong, can... I have some water so I can dilute it. So I can dilute it. In this case, it's being used as the active verb to dilute something. In this case, it's being used as an ag adjective to be diluted, to be diluted. And this is our adjective, diluted. Now, our targets. The targets may be diluted. So what are the targets that they're proposing? It was 30, right? 30%, 30 by 30, 30%. So if it's diluted, what would the target be? Well, it would be anything less than 30, right? It, that's how it would be less strong. So it might be 25%, 24%, 22%. Hopefully nothing like 10% or 5% because if it were 5% or 10%, it would be severely diluted. I would say that. This is just, you know, a little diluted. This is severely diluted. So that's how you would dilute a target. You would make it less strong. And remember, we commonly use this with beverages. So that's the end of our article. I hope you enjoyed it and enjoyed all the vocabulary and grammar. And the topic is very interesting, isn't it? I wonder if your country is going to participate and reserve 30% of your country just for natural environment. Do you think that's a good idea? Share your thoughts in the comments below and I hope you enjoyed this lesson. You are doing such a great job. Now this is an advanced masterclass. So let's expand your vocabulary with 15 advanced words, but I'm going to quiz you at the same time. This will help make sure you permanently remember this vocabulary. Let's get started. So here's how the test is going to work. You're going to see a sentence and there's going to be a blank, a missing word. And then you're going to be given two options, option A, option B. And then you have to decide which option completes the sentence. Now, when I give you the options, I'll give you three seconds. Of course, that isn't very long, right? So feel free to hit pause, take as much time as you need, and then hit play when you're ready to see the answer. Sound good? Are you ready to start the quiz? Let's go with question number one. Do you think the discount will the client? Which option, A or B? I'll give you three seconds. Appease the client. Appease is a verb. We use this when you want to give someone something they want in order to make them happy 
or in order to prevent further disagreement. So I'm giving them a discount to make them happy. It will appease them. Now, if you said B, appeal, keep in mind that appeal has a very similar meaning. It means to be attractive to, but grammatically the sentence is incorrect because if you use appeal, it's appeal to the client. And because I don't have the preposition to, B is an incorrect option grammatically. Question two. She's a very employee. Option one, option two. The correct answer is A, diligent. She's a very diligent employee. To be diligent, this means to be careful or using a lot of effort and attention to detail. For example, I worked diligently on the report all week. So notice in this case, it's an adverb, diligently. I worked diligently on the report all week. Question three, sorry, I can't help. I'm at math, A or B? B, inept, I'm inept at math. To be inept at something, this means to not be skilled or to be ineffective at something. I'm inept at math. Number four, she's the most member of our team. A or B? A, gregarious. B is incorrect grammatically. We can't say most great you would say greatest, right? So grammatically, B doesn't work. A, gregarious. To be gregarious, when someone is described as gregarious, it means that they're very social. They enjoy being around other people. So what about you? Let us know in the comments. Would you describe yourself as a gregarious person? Do you enjoy being around other people? Are you very social? Hmm. Let us know in the comments so you can practice that word. Number five, we need to with the accounting department, A or B. The answer is B, follow up with. Grammatically, A is incorrect. You don't follow out with someone. You follow up with someone. And this means that you continue a discussion or conversation that was previously started. I could say I already followed up with the accounting department. I already continued the conversation we had previously started. Number six, that's a difficult concept to A or B. B, to grasp. When you grasp something, it simply means that you understand it. So it's the same as saying that's a difficult concept to understand. That's a difficult concept to grasp. Number seven, you should all your debt to reduce your interest rate. A or B? B, consolidate, consolidate. When you consolidate two or more things, it means you combine them together. So if I said the two firms consolidated last year, this means that last year there was firm A, firm B, but now because they consolidated, there's one firm. So the two become one, consolidate. Number eight, the book discusses his illness and resignation from politics, A or B? A, subsequent. 
his subsequent resignation from politics. This has a simple meaning. Subsequent just means something that comes after something else. So first he had his illness and after he resigned. His subsequent resignation. His resignation that came after his illness. We commonly use this as an adverb to start a sentence. So I could say, he moved to Australia. Subsequently, he got married. And I'm using subsequently to let you know that he got married after something else. And that something else is after he moved to Australia. He moved to Australia. Subsequently, he got married. Number nine. He gets stressed out when he's A or B. The correct answer has to be B under pressure because over pressure is the wrong preposition. The preposition you need is under pressure, to be under pressure. And that's simply when you have a lot of work and you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling stressed out. You can use this positively and say, I work really well under pressure. So when I have a lot of work, I actually perform better, not worse. I work really well under pressure. Number 10, women face a lot of in the workplace, A or B. Well, ostrich is a bird, <laughs> so women don't face a lot of ostriches in the workplace. They face a lot of obstacles, obstacles. An obstacle is something that blocks you and it can be something physical like a roadblock or it can be something non-physical like discrimination. So it's something that blocks you from making progress. That's an obstacle. Number 11, thank you for your remark, A or B. The answer is B, pertinent, pertinent remark. When something is pertinent, it means it's relevant to the topic or discussion at hand. So let's say you're having a conversation and then someone raises a point and you think the point is very relevant to the topic or conversation, you can say that's pertinent. That's pertinent. That's relevant related to our topic at hand. Number 12, you can that to the interns. A or B? B, delegate. You can delegate that to the interns. When you delegate something is when you give someone else responsibility for a task or a specific job. So when you're doing a task that you really don't want to be doing, you can say, I wish I had someone to delegate this to. I wish I had someone who I could give this task to. Number 13, I have a really workload this month, A or B. A, heavy. B is a direct translation. It's not something that we use in natural English. It sounds awkward and unnatural. A heavy is the adjective that we use to describe our workload. When your workload is heavy, it simply means you have a lot of work to do. And what's the opposite of heavy? The opposite? is light, right? Light. So when you don't have a lot of work to do, you would say, I have a light workload. Heavy workload, light workload. So what about you? How would you describe your workload right now? Would you say it's heavy or light? Let us know in the comments so you practice this new expression. Number 14, the police have been unable to what caused the explosion. A or B? 
B, ascertain, ascertain. When you ascertain something, you discover something. So to ascertain the cause of the explosion is to discover the cause of the explosion, to understand why. So when the police do understand why they discover it, they can say, we've finally ascertained what caused the explosion. It was a faulty gas line. And then they can tell you the cause of the explosion. And finally, your last question in the quiz, number 15. You've been all week. Just do it already. A or B? The answer is B, procrastinating. You've been procrastinating all week. When you procrastinate, it means that you delay doing something but that something has to be done and you delay doing it. And why? Well, generally because it's unpleasant, like chores around the house, cleaning the garage, cleaning the bathroom, doing the dishes, it's unpleasant. Or it's simply boring, like organizing your closet or filing your paperwork. So you delay doing it, but it has to be done. That's procrastinating. You are doing such an amazing job. Your English is already more advanced compared to when you started. Before you go, let's review three more words that students struggle with my beginner students, and my most advanced students. Let's review how to use still, yet, and already. So throughout this video, pay attention to when they're used, pay attention to the verb tense that's commonly used with them, and also pay attention to the placement of the word, so where it comes in the sentence structure. With that said, let's start off with already. We use already to talk about something that has happened or may have happened. So think about the verb tenses. We're talking about the past and your verb tenses are going to be the past simple or the present perfect. For example, I could say, I already ate. I already ate. Of course, that action took place in the past. Now, you could invite me to the movies and I could say, I've already seen that movie. Present perfect. I've already seen that movie. And of course, it was in the past that I saw that movie. Now, notice for the placement of already, it's generally placed before the main verb. So now it's your turn. Pause the video and put a sentence using already in the past simple and the present perfect in the comments below. Now let's talk about yet. We generally use yet in a question form or a negative sentence. And your verb tense is going to be the present perfect. As a question, you're asking a question about the past. So I could ask, have you eaten yet? Have you eaten yet? And of course, if you want to answer yes, you would use which one? Yes, I've already eaten. Now we can combine a question and the reply could be in the negative. So they could both use yet. For example, I could ask you, have you decided yet? And your answer in the negative would be, no, I haven't decided yet. Now notice the placement of yet. We put it after the main verb. So it's generally at the end of your sentence. All right, so now why don't you try a question with yet and then a reply to that question and your reply will be in the negative as well. So put those two examples in the comments. Now let's talk about still. We use still to talk about an action that started in the past and continues until now. Your verb tenses are generally going to be the present simple or the present continuous. For example, I could say, I'm still going to the party. 
So keep in mind, I made a decision to go to the party maybe last week, okay? I said, I'm going to the party. Now, maybe the weather is really bad today, so a lot of people aren't going to the party anymore. But I want to confirm that this action that happened in the past, my decision, it still applies now. So I can say, I'm still going to the party. I'm still going to the party. Now we use this with routines a lot, which is why you'll hear it in the present simple. For example, I could say, I still go to the gym every day. So I started going to the gym every day in the past, maybe a month ago. So my friend, who I haven't seen in a while, wants to know if I still go to the gym. And I could say, yeah, I still go to the gym every day. Now notice the placement of still, just like with already, we're going to put it before the main verb. And you know what to do. Now it's your turn to practice, so why don't you try a sentence in the present simple and present continuous and put those in the comments below. Wow, you did such an amazing job today. Do you want me to keep making these masterclasses for you? If you do put masterclass, put masterclass in the comments and I'll make another one. And of course, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe so you're notified every time I post a new lesson. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. I have another masterclass I know you'll love. Make sure you watch it right now.